So we're here tonight to welcome Mr. J. Michael Straczynski, also known as Joe, he tells me. Tells me. Um, and he has a huge and long career. He works in films, television series, novels, short stories, comic books, radio dramas, and other media. I don't even, Twitter maybe, Twitter, I don't know, everything. Uh, he is a playwright, former journalist, author of the complete book of script writing. He was the creator and showrunner for the science fiction television series Babylon 5, and I know we have at least one fan in here. It's spinoff Crusade, as well as Jeremiah, a series loosely based on Herman Huppin's comics. He also wrote the four Babylon 5 TV movies produced alongside the series. He was the writer for the long-running Marvel Comics book series, The Amazing Superman. It just keeps going. There's more words here. He also famously wrote for Thor, Superman, The Superman, Earth One, original graphic novels, Before Watchmen, and Wonder Woman. World War Z. Uh huh. In 2009, he was nominated for the BAFTA Award for his screenplay for Changeling. His new series, Sense 8, premiered in 2015. Made with the Wachowskis? Yes. Well, Slate called it a queer masterpiece, and I spent the whole weekend binge watching it. So, that is Mr. J. Michael Straczynski. Uh, also moderating tonight's Q&A is producer Tova Leiter. Tova's credits include Glory with Denzel Washington, Oliver Stone's Nixon, Evita with Antonio Banderas, and Madonna, and Varsity Blues, one of my favorites. Now, please help me in introducing our very special guest, Joe Straczynski. I mentioned to you earlier, I write 10 to 12 hours a day, every day, except New Year's Day, my birthday, and Christmas Day. Your writing output is just amazing, really. It's just comic books, and you started with the play when you were young, and journalistic work, and TV series, and movies, and you wrote for, like, Ron Howard, and you wrote for, like, Tom Cruise, and you wrote for Breckheimer, and you wrote for Tom Hanks' company, and so on and so forth. So. Um, Obviously, you don't sleep. And second, <laughs> how, how did you start in the business? I've actually started numerous times that have a tendency to firebomb my own career on a regular basis. I think it's important to do that from time to time. I started off as a um, writing plays that were produced locally when I was 17 years old. Um, I always knew I was going to be a writer and began preparing from the moment I could actually read a book like age, age four or five. So my first four years were wasted. But after that, <laughs> I began preparing to become a writer. I knew just coming into it. And the thing about it is, I come from ridiculously poor roots. Um, no connections to the business at all. Um, we moved my first 17 years 21 times. Wow. Um, because my father had a unique economic philosophy. Blow into town, run up a lot of bills, and split. <laughs> So we'd be in a different city, you know, guys would show up in the morning with badges and bills and at night the U-Haul backs up and we go somewhere else from New Jersey to Illinois to Texas to California. And <clears throat> guys who were in my neighborhood, guys who I grew up with, were never expected to do anything. We, we were considered dead-enders. Either you end up working in a mechanic shop when you got older or you end up in jail. Those are your options. So when I said I want to be a writer, they always kind of laughed, you know, as would I have done. Um, <laughs> But after studying and studying and studying, when I was 17, the engine turned over in my head. What had happened was I was I, I, I had gotten most of what writing involved with, but voice and, and style, the difference between voice and style, was eluding me. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure out what the distinction was. I was reading a book by H.P. Lovecraft, mm -hmm. whose style was way over the top. And it was so big that I understood something what that was. I realized that... Voice is who you are. The style is the clothes you wear. So you can adopt a different style, but your voice within that style mm -hmm. is always the same. Mm -hmm. And when I realized how that worked, the engine in my head turned over, and suddenly I, that day I wrote two short stories, a couple of poems. The next day I wrote two more short stories and began having them sold locally as little articles or magazines and newspapers and began working in plays and getting those produced and was a reporter for... <clears throat> About 10 years, I actually did pretty well at that. 
and ended up going from LA Times to um, LA Reader to Time Incorporated, mm -hmm. um, which what got me out of journalism. It's a whole different story for a different time, but I left that fireball in my career in reporting, went into television and animation, where I worked on shows like, pardon the expression, He-Man and Masters of the Universe, <laughs> Shira, Real Ghostbusters, and others, and then, when, and then fireball my career in animation, went from there to live action, and was on that up through Jeremiah for Showtime, which was a hideous experience. I had firebomb my career in television, and went from there to, to films, and did that, and now I'm circled back to television again. Wow. So I failed upward, is the answer to the question. <laughs> That's the American way. Embrace your inner failure. <laughs> I'm write that Weren't down. you? I read on Wikipedia, and I don't know whether it's true well, or it must not. Be true, it's on Wikipedia. Yes, <laughs> and it said somewhere in the last ten years or something, you were chosen one of the screenwriters to watch. Is that true? Yeah, it's really kind of funny. After being in television for like 15 years, <laughs> I wrote *Changeling*, mm -hmm. right, which got all this attention, and suddenly I was invited to all these studio meetings. And most of them didn't know that I had been in television before. They thought this is my first script. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, and, and and again, this up and coming screenwriter. I'm so at this reception with like eight guys in their twenties and me. You know? <laughs> the best part of it was after Changeling became Changeling, I ended up going to, to all the different studios. They all wanted to meet me and see who this you know Yeti was that had just done this. And I walk into this one studio. Visualize, if you will, a long conference table, and along the sides of the conference table, there's a president's, vice presidents of production, development, yes men, flunkies, plenipotentiaries, <laughs> toadies, the whole <laughs> catastrophe. And the end of the table is Mr. Big, who runs the studio. And he begins giving me his background. I ran Paramount for two years. I was in charge of Fox for three years. I just had a, a production for this studio for two years. I ran this studio for three years, gave me the whole litany, and then sat back to see my reaction. And I said, so what you're saying is you can't hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> and the president, the vice president of production, the development people, the flunkies, the plant the yes men, the toadies, went white. <laughs> Mr. Big took a moment to realize what I just said. And started laughing. Of course. And could not stop laughing. Because most people who walked into that room did so from a position of fear. Right. The most important thing you can do as writers is never, ever, ever be afraid. There's nothing they can do to you. And he, because I was not afraid of him, he respected me. And actually, I walked out the door with an assignment. So, you know, <laughs> never, ever, ever, ever let him see you being afraid. <laughs> that is one good piece of advice. One good piece so of advice. So what you're going to get tonight, too. Yeah. All right. So I want to ask one question, and then I know she wants to ask you, because she saw all the sense A, too. But The Changeling, which was with Angelina Jolie and uh, directed by Clint Eastwood, it was startling for me to see one credit of a writer. When is it that you see one credited writer? If right? The There's dies. always three or four. <laughs> what? The other one dies. Yes. Exactly. Oh. Or poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Clint Eastwood, that's what he does. Clint Eastwood just doesn't rewrite the writer, you know? He likes the script. You give him a script, he likes it. This is the script that he shoots. He mm -hmm. doesn't do, you know, a lot of the thing. And yet, in all the other jobs, and I've been in those jobs, and so on, so you know, it's just. And by the way, the seventies were pretty good about that. Yeah. Okay. There was one mm -hmm. voice mm -hmm. basically. Then Ken Simpson and Breckheimer, and they hired. Yeah. One for dialogue, one for action, one for this, one for this, and they started the whole number. And um, can you say? something about that situation. I'm sure you have something to say about this. No, I gotta go. Um, yeah, it, it's, I'm sorry, I'm a pain in the ass. I just am, it's just it's part, of my part of my charm. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's I, pretty entertaining. No, I would never suit the charm. Um, <laughs> it, when that, that, when Ron Howard bought the script yeah. to direct initially for himself. Yeah. <clears throat> he couldn't do it, brought in Clint, and 
like you, I know that the, the, how the town works is that you the director comes on, they give you notes, and you come back with a draft. So they finally said, Clint wants to meet you. So I went down to his office at Warner Brothers on the lot, and he comes in. We're sitting on the couch. And the funny thing is, Clint doesn't really look at you a whole lot. So we're sitting like this. He's looking that way the entire time I'm talking to him. He's talking to me. I'm like, <laughs> and finally, we're done with the meeting, and I say, you know, do you want any revisions? Because obviously you may have some thoughts. I can change a few things. And suddenly he looks at me, and it's Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> and you remember what your colon is there for. <laughs> and he says, you know how many movies I've made? A lot. <laughs> a lot, that's what I thought. Point is, he said, I've gotten more phone calls about this script than any other script I've ever produced saying, don't screw it up. My job is to not screw it up. Don't change a word. Okay. I love that, that about him. Um, the, the ultimate irony of, of, Sensei, of, of, of Changeling was that <clears throat> we went to Cannes and we missed winning the Palm d'Or by one vote, we discovered from a, a French critic who didn't believe the story was true. He said, police would not handle someone hmm. in this fashion. Obviously not from here. Mm -hmm. um, and Clint called me, because then the story had based on a true story in the yes. credit. And, and he said, well, half of what he said was un unrepeatable, but what the, the gist of it was sit down with the universal attorneys, go through all of your notes with them, show them where every single scene of the script comes from to get a true story, not based on a true story on the screen oh, from now on. <clears throat> so I sat down with the Universal Attorneys, and I had done a year's worth plus of research. I had like mm -hmm. 2,500 pages of documentation about that story. Mm -hmm. And I showed them every single case where every single line came from a transcript or a hearing document or a court record or a hospital record, and we got a true story, which has very rarely ever been awarded to anybody. Right. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. You're still pissed mm -hmm. off about it. <laughs> Losing the losing the palm though I want to vote yeah nah, I'm still pissed off about it well yeah. see there you are yeah. he would have liked yeah, it because actually Clint likes the French one of the few Americans because he lived in Europe sure and he he would appreciate the palm door some people don't care yeah it's there in France <laughs> who cares. <laughs> Uh, I have so many questions for you. I have no answers. All right. <laughs> then I'll just read you the questions. I may have some suggestions, but no answers. Okay. You have some suggestions. <clears throat> okay. okay. So we have a lot of filmmakers and screenwriters in, in this room. And one, one thing I want to know for you is the difference in working on film, working on a screenplay versus planning television, Th pitching television, planning it out, figuring out, outlining. What's the difference in the process for you? A screenplay is you sitting alone in a room and writing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I hate the pitching process. I'm the worst person in the world when it comes to pitching because I'm a writer, but I, I hate being around people. Nothing personal in this, I, I promise you. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just telling you now you scare the hell out of me. Um, and so I, most of my work that I've done, I've done writing the spec or mm -hmm. getting a rewrite to do. I don't tend to go in to pitch these things. You're working on a TV show, particularly if you're a producer, your job is there to shepherd all these people together, come up with the, the overall storyline, um, and develop that story and those characters over a period of months and years. Mm -hmm. Whereas in screenplays, you're telling a particular specific story. That's a, that's a very broad answer and probably completely useless to you. Oh, it's a, it's a start. Okay. I got another one for you. Excellent. All right, so. It's worse from here. How did you get involved with Thor? I had been <clears throat> writing for Marvel Comics for a while, and they wanted to bring back Thor, who had been gone for you know a few years, and nobody else wanted to get near the character. They offered it to Neil Gaiman, he ran like hell. They offered it to Mark Millar, he ran like hell. And I'm like, I, I wanted it. I said, give it, give it, I, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and so they said, all right, give it to Joe. And the problem was that no one knew what to do with the character. Because mm -hmm. he doesn't seem to fit anywhere else. It comes from this tradition of very faux Shakespearean dialogue. And what do you do with Asgard? And so they gave it to me and they said, what do you want to do? I said, first off, main thing is I want to move Asgard to Oklahoma. Uh. And he looked at me as if I had three heads and feathers. <laughs> he 
which I was wearing that day, but that's a different story. Okay. Um, and I said, why? <laughs> and I said, Iron Man next to Thor, not much of a power difference. Uh -huh. Thor next to an ordinary person makes him more godlike, mm -hmm. but also makes him more human. Plus, visually, it's really cool. You, see, you go to Oklahoma to the flatlands, it's like flat, 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 Asgard, flat, flat, flat. You know? <laughs> and I'm all about contrast. Uh -huh. And so they said, none of them having wanted it anyway, sure, go out and have fun. You know? um, we'll, we'll see you on the way down the Titanic. <laughs> uh, so I did it and really focused strongly on the characters. I reimagined re how Thor spoke. I made it more, not Shakespearean, um, but... Um, formalized, if you think, um, who wrote The Ladies Not For Burning, Christopher Fry, mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing, and more accessible to a modern audience, but still formalized, and created relationships with the local townsfolk in often very funny ways. I mean, they wanted to send him some letters, and there is no address for Asgard, so you have one of the folks in the town comes out <laughs> and with a puts a mailbox, you know, by Asgard, one Asgard road. You know. <laughs> and the cops tell him, you can't just put Asgard in the middle of this, you don't own this land. So with the incantation, he rises at four feet above the ground. So I'm not on the ground anymore. It's four feet above the ground. <laughs> just to mess with him. And what, to their surprise, happened was that the book became one of the top five sellers for Marvel and stayed that way for the entire time that I worked on it. There wasn't a lot of action in it. There wasn't a lot of big, huge events. Mm -hmm. It was just a strong character story. Mm -hmm. And people reacted to that, and they, and they responded to it. And that's hit the template for the movie. They wanted to put right. that setting into more of a small town. The, the outfit that he wears here is based on the outfit that I and the artist uh -huh. came together and put together. So they said, we want you to be you know, involved with the film. I, I had an outstanding obligation to another film, so I said, I can do the outline for you. Okay. But I can't do the entire script. So I came on board did the outline for them, and they proceeded to go off from there. And of course, the great irony is that Ken, Ken Brana, who directed this, wanted me to do a cameo in this. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Bad idea. So I show up just to be one of a bunch of guys in line, and he says, I want you to actually act in the scene. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> Trust me, you don't. He said, I want you to. So in the movie you just saw, there's a scene where a red truck, after the, after the hammer's been thrown out of Asgard, yeah. and craters in the ground, yeah. a red truck yeah. drives up, but a guy gets out and tries to pick it up. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. That Wasn't Stan was Lee cute. in one of the scenes? Oh, Stan was also, he was also <laughs> that same day, as a matter of fact, yeah. 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 Um, they yeah, got Candace, all those Marvel people to basically not to have to pay extra. No, we got paid. We got paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I said, you know, I, despite all evidence to the contrary, Ken decided that I could act. So there, you know, there you are. <laughs> well, I love the contrast of Thor walking through the streets of the small town in, in New Mexico and the difference uh, when he asked for a horse at the pet <laughs> store. Yes. Like, little moments like that. That just makes the character work. It's those, yeah. those small moments. One of the things I did in, in the, the book was, as Asgard is now by this small Oklahoma town, um, we see how they inter interact. And at one point, you know, the, the town council asked, do you have indoor plumbing? And they said, mm -hmm. no, we just throw it over the wall. You know. <laughs> um, but my favorite scene, there's a, a guy who's a, a chef cook in a, in a diner mm -hmm. who begins falling in love with this Asgardian woman who is just a goddess. And she likes him a lot also. And, and he, but he keeps thinking, how is this ever going to work? You know? yeah. And he's in the diner, and Donald Blake, who's the, the uh, alter ego for Thor, is there. And <clears throat> he's lamenting this. And, he, and his, his dad used to say to him, you know, a fish can love a bird, but where would they build a house together? <laughs> and and Don's, Don says, by the edge of the river. Aww. Aww. So sweet. And that's when the guy decides to pursue it. But let me ask you, um, you obviously you write a lot of science fiction and comic book. What is it about it that you love so much? Is it a man thing? Because all the men I know like it. It, it might be a guy thing. It's also a geek thing. I mean, I grew up being the, the geek of the schools that I went to. I um, but for me, in all the comics I read as a kid, Superman was kind of it for me. Because mm -hmm. uh, coming from a background of a poor and uh, no opportunities and horrific family. 
Superman could do anything. Yeah. He could fly and he could, you know, and nothing could hurt him. And I learned my ethics from mm -hmm. comic books and Superman in particular. So for me, it's, it became not just, you know, a fun thing to read, it became a survival mechanism. No. The heroism, I think, is and the and the morals. The moral codes are always really uh, solidly laid out. Oh yeah, and I, I, that's again where I learned mine. To the point where, a few years ago, uh, I was at a um, comic book convention in Chicago, and you ever been to like the comic cons and the big ones like San Diego mm -hmm. or whatever else? The dealers' rooms are like you know from here to New Jersey. They're just really really long. And you know, the guy is selling at booths artwork and chachkas and expensive stuff and cheap stuff and just general garden variety crap. And I'm in this row of booths in Chicago dealer's room, the convention, and I hear someone yell, stop him. <laughs> and I look down the row, and it's a guy like in his 20s, a sailor it turned out, who just grabbed a bunch of expensive artwork, like tens of thousands of dollars worth of art, and was making a run for it. And the crowd, like the Red Sea, they parted, you know. And I brought him down, <laughs> tackled him like a gazelle, <laughs> brought him down. The guy who caught up with me, who was booth it was, we held him for the cops to show up. And afterward, uh, they're taking him away. And the guy who runs the convention, Mike, Mike Sanjiancoma, walks up and says, well, why did you do that? You could have been seriously hurt. I took it back to where I'd been standing uh -huh. under a 10 foot tall cutout of Superman. <laughs> so how could I stand in front of that? And do nothing. And not take that man down. Yeah. That thief down. Yeah. Exactly. Been, been Spider Man would be even better given the mythology of that, but mm -hmm. it was Superman. So. It worked. Yeah. It worked. Wow, fantastic. Well, I want to get back to the issue of uh, the importance of character. Yeah. Character development, character mm -hmm. building, because I find that incredibly powerful in Sense 8. And every once in a while, there's an action sequence and somebody kicks someone else's ass and it's wonderful. But. The emotions are so strong. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's remarkable. It's astounding. They can't see it. They're too young. OK, well, the ones in the front who are my students, you guys should watch it. Uh, and I'm wondering... Can we just tell the student that this is um, a new series that he's doing for Netflix with the Wachowskis, who did The Matrix, right? Yes. So. Um, so on the question of character and, and emotion. Um, to me, writing is all about emotion. It's, it's mm -hmm. ultimately what it comes down to. I don't care how good your plot is, or your effects, or your action sequences. If you don't care about the characters, you have got nothing. People may not remember you know, all the whaling technology that was discussed in Moby Dick, but you remember Ahab. Mm -hmm. you know? um, for me, it, it, it all starts and ends with character. Uh, and my writing process is built around that in a kind of a weird way. That if you want, you want the secret to how to write, the, the real, the real deal. Don't tell anyone I told you this. It's, um, imagine your best friend for a second. If you haven't got a best friend, borrow one from the person next to you. <laughs> Walking across the living room at night, the lights are off, and they bang their shin on the coffee table. Now you know your friend. You know exactly what your friend's going to say when that happens. You don't have to work at it. You have to think about it. You just know. Mm -hmm. And you can write it down. Writing is exactly the same. It is getting to know the characters so well that whatever you drop them into, you lay back and you write down what they do. It's very zen-like that way. You don't, it, it's, it's not supposed to be homework. It's not mm -hmm. supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be fun. And by focusing on, on the character, let them do the work for you, it becomes effortless. It keeps the character always at the center of the story. Hmm. Um, I worked with um, Jim Cameron uh, a little while back mm -hmm. working on a Forbidden Planet remake. And he said one of the smartest things I've ever heard. He said he used to think that writing science fiction was about writing familiar characters in unfamiliar settings. Mm -hmm. It took me 10 years to realize I was wrong. It's about familiar relationships in unfamiliar settings. So uh, Terminator 2 is a father-son relationship, even though it's not. Mm -hmm. Aliens is a mother-daughter story, even though it's not. You may not be able to buy into you know, alien civilizations or strange futuristic events, but the emotion of what mm -hmm. a father-son or mother-daughter relationship is will bring you in every time. So I always believe in going for the emotions first and foremost as the gateway drug and pulling back from there into what the plot is. Right. And I think that that's, that's incredibly important 
because we we generally we people don't have superpowers. We can't grab Speak onto it. Oh, okay, all right. You did tackle that guy, <laughs> that thief, and I never tackled a thief. Not yet. Maybe later. Maybe later. All right. Um, but we don't have superpowers. We don't live in these alternate universes. We don't live uh, in these beautifully production design places that have secret entries and exits that make no sense. But what we do have is emotions and relationships. And I think it's incredibly important for writers to connect our audiences to those moments so that we can become interested in these other elements of the storytelling, the alternate universes. How did y'all build, well, first of all, how did you get involved with the Wachowskis, with Sensei? It was the Polish mafia, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it through the screenplay you did for Joel Silver, The Ninja Assassin? No, that came later. Um, they actually were, were fans of mine. They were Babylon 5 fans who liked my comics oh, that's work. that's cool. I didn't know that until I got the invitation to see the last Matrix movie at the Disney Center downtown. Uh -huh. And I didn't, my lawyer said, we got this invitation, do you know anybody involved with Matrix? I said, no, but I'm happy to go, I love the movies. So I go up to the Disney Theater, I'm up in the balcony, uh -huh. and this couple sits next to me, and uh, one woman says to me, what, what do you do with this? I said, I have nothing, I'm just here to see the movie, I, and this is who I am. She leaned over to Lana, it's the Babylon 5 guy. Mm -hmm. And when I just shot up out of the chair and came over and began talking Spider-Man and Babylon 5 and all this stuff, and they are trying to run the movie, and they're like, you know, <laughs> We're talking Babylon 5 and comic books. <laughs> and so we became friends after that. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> we worked um, uh, a few years later together on a Ninja Assassin. Okay. Which, um, not a terribly deep movie, because it's, well, Ninja Assassin. Um, <laughs> but what's funny about that is, and this is kind of, again, where the, the effortless approach to writing pays off. I didn't know they were working on Ninja Assassin until I got a phone call from Lana saying, we're in a bind, can you come see us? This is on a Monday. Mm -hmm. They come the next day on Tuesday. And they said, <clears throat> we are six weeks from camera on this movie, and the script doesn't work. We mm -hmm. need to have a complete rewrite, fade in to fade out. Can you do it for us? I said, you're my friends, whatever you want me to do, I'm happy to do it. When do you have to have it? They said, it has to go out to actors' agents on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> this is Tuesday. <laughs> So I said, I said, we know how fast you are. Can, can you pull this off? And I said, I'll have it on Friday. Went home, fired up the coffee maker. Oh. I did the math of how many pages per hour that would have to be. Oh, my gosh. And how many hours I could sleep each day, which is three. <gasps> and I just made sure that every hour I hit that number, and I didn't go to sleep until I hit that page count for the day, I would doze at the, at the desk, uh -huh. put that pillow on the, on the keyboard and nap get up, have a cup of coffee, keep on going. And on Friday morning, I, I emailed off the script, um, which Warner's had no notes on, which scared the hell out of me. Because <laughs> if Warner was like something, you gotta worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and they shot it, you know, and then became friends. And then they said a couple of years ago, we, you know, come up to San Francisco, we wanna find something else to do together. And we, we really wanna do television badly. And if you want something done badly, you call me. Uh, if you want it done well, you call Joss Whedon. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> went up there and we worked on what the story was going to be and wrote the first three episodes uh, on spec. Mm -hmm. Took it out and our first meeting was at Netflix and you know, figured, okay, fine, have it well. Let's go to the next meeting and they called to take it off the market and said, we're going to give you the budget, go make the show. No kidding. Yeah. So y'all wrote the first three episodes? Correct. And had you outlined the following? We knew episodes? we knew where it was going to go in our heads. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And how did it work working with those folks? Did you sit in the room and write together? Did you outline together? Yeah, we we, we did everything together. Um, did do you all know the con the concept, the premise of Sense Eight? It's so cool. Okay, what the idea is. Lana and I particularly are big believers in the notion of community. The problem we have as a culture right now is that we have been you know, marginalized and tribalized and factionalized to within an inch of our lives. If the country were divided geographically as it is politically right now, you'd be hearing gunfire in the distance. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to talk about the fact that whatever your gender identity is or your sexuality or your ethnic background, that the common coin of our shared humanity is stronger than all of it, stronger than what divides us. And we wanted to do a story on a global scale that was about community. And 
one of the things that entered into the discussion was uh, I have I have friends three dubious words but I do have I have friends um, <laughs> not many not many no it's getting shorter by the by the day um, who will when they're in different parts of the world they'll all queue up a DVD at the same time of a movie and then as the movie plays they will text back and forth with each other about what they're seeing uh-huh. and they're sharing that experience even though they're in different parts of the world mm-hmm. so I said what about you know characters who become telepathically linked to each other and suddenly there's someone in your head who knows everything that you know about yourself mm-hmm. and you, only you can see them but no one else can and that person knows your secrets your background your skills your abilities and there's eight characters who share this hive mind and to me as, as a writer what's appealing about that is I have a theory that there are five kinds of truth the truth to tell the casual strangers and people you meet Mm-hmm. The truth to tell to your friends and to your family. The truth you tell to only to a few people in your, in your entire life. The truth you tell to yourself. The truth you won't even admit to yourself. <laughs> and we want to do a story about truth number five. Because mm-hmm. suddenly someone's in your head and has access to your secrets, and our secrets are what define us in many respects. So that became the core of it, and then we built out the universe from there. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Can I, uh, okay, I think we need to open up for the students. Okay. Absolutely. To ask uh, the questions. So whoever wants to ask questions and don't be shy, please go to the microphone. Thank you for coming tonight. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Um, for me, <clears throat> script writing is my heroine as well. So <laughs> I want to ask, uh, I'm an international student, so I've been having so many contradictory thoughts about the kind of film you can make um, as you said you inspired this question is there a place in the US for non-American story I think there is a place for international stories in, in the US marketplace if they're done correctly okay. which means that you write it in a universal fashion um, one thing that Sense8 is about but also all good drama is about so it doesn't matter where you live or where you come from. We all want for ourselves the same things to achieve happiness, to um, you know, have a better world for our kids and, our, and, and to have a better future for ourselves. So I think that those truths are universal. As long as you, in any international story, you keep to those essential truths, you will always find a market for it. Um, it's when you lose yourself in the details or in, in the um, non specific to the human condition points that you can lose the audience. I, I found that it, if you want your story to be universal, the bigger you want it to be, the smaller you have to make it. I'll give you an example of that. Um, when I was working on uh, the Twilight Zone series back in the 80s, uh, I was writing an episode and I wanted to have a, a married couple argue about something. And I went for the big stuff, rent, you know, other big, huge marital problems. And there were, there were a good relationship, but I just wanted to have an argument. And my friend uh, Harlan Ellison said, you're doing this wrong. He said, make it as small as you humanly can. Make it a stupid argument about something petty. Where he would say to her at, at breakfast, pass me the, you know, the jam, dear. And she would say, here's the jelly. Just to fuck with him. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> and, so one, and one day the characters got angry and, you know, Stop, I asked you for the jam, give me the goddamn jam. Yeah. And then left, and then she got to an accident. Yeah. So the smaller you make it, oddly enough, the more universal it becomes. You know, Mark Twain again said that the, our, our universal humanity is about jealousy and love and passion and regard. So as long as you keep your story in those elements, I think you will be um, able to sell that story almost anywhere. Hi. So, uh, um, first off, I just wanted to say that I loved Babylon 5, and uh, uh, my, my dad and I would uh, uh, watch it all the time when I was growing up, and uh, just loved it. And yeah, I did that to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, so, I, I just was wondering if you could just uh, touch on just uh, how the uh, collaboration of the, the writing process was different from, like, Babylon 5 to Sense8, and, uh, and just, uh, just writing sci- uh, sci-fi and... Uh, just uh, how that was, those was different. Yeah, that one five was really kind of a one man show to a large extent. The, the first two years we had freelance writers for half of it. 
then it got so convoluted that I had to sort of do all the writing myself because I just couldn't separate it out by saying this episode ends here and that one begins here. There's your assignment. It, it was the first series to do a five-year arc. We were the first ones to do that. And because I needed to figure it out as I, I did it, it was hard to assign on episodes. So I ended up writing out of 110 episodes, 92. Mm-hmm. Wow. As well as show writing the darn thing. So that was kind of a one-man show. Whereas Sensei was the three of us sitting in a room and just chewing through all the details and all the background and where these characters come from, who are they. And we ended up um, covering the walls with these boards, metallic um, mag- magnetized boards, that had three-by-five cards on them with going this way with who the characters were, then their backgrounds, who they were, where they came from, their fathers, their parents. So in this way, across was their individual arcs. And we did, over the period of like a couple of months, we finally worked this thing out, that everything laid out day by day what, and time by time what the whole thing was. And then I'm looking at this construction one day, and I went, oh, crap. And Lana said, what? I said, time zones. Because they're all connected telepathically. Mm-hmm. And if one of our characters in San Francisco was in trouble, the character who was in Seoul can't help them because they're asleep. Mm-hmm. So we now have to redo the entire thing to incorporate time zones. And they kind of hated me from that point on for, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> and there was a lot more travel involved in doing, doing Sensei. We, went to, we shot the show on location, as opposed to if I was all done on stage, in, in um, San Francisco, Chicago, London, Mexico City, Berlin, Iceland, Mumbai, Nairobi, and Seoul. Wow. No stage work at all. Wow. Uh, it was it was quite an experience. So it was pretty much as different as you can get from each other on every possible level. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. You can feel that in authenticity in the frame. Yeah. It's yeah. remarkable. Hi. Hi. I'm Mike. You uh, certainly are. <laughs> don't, no man say otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was wondering what activities or stuff would you recommend for young writers to do to like boost up their writing technique or something? I don't know. <laughs> for you, I start with push-ups to begin with. I think. Like, <laughs> Thank you. Thing. Yeah, I'm very puny. I have, the, yeah. That's the first thing. Super just, foods. For sheer survival. I I'm would, very yeah. bony. Yeah. Super As was foods. I. There was there was a period when I was you know using my whatever money I got from writing to buy supplies rather than food, and I was my current size. I had six foot three, and I weighed 140 pounds. I had a 28 inch waist. Um, what exercises you write? The, the best thing you can do seriously, is to read scripts. Read, because when you're watching the film, what works is often invisible. You can see it on the page, but you can't always see it on the screen. Uh, and particularly, look at, I would say read the scripts for, but look at really, really bad films. I agree. Because what works in a good film is often invisible, but what is crappy yes. in a bad film is pretty obvious. Yeah. Yeah. You can learn more from seeing a bad film sometimes than a good film because it's like the magician, you know, how the hell did I can see what they did wrong over there. Um, and just write every day. The, what you have to become is transparent as a writer and write all the crap out of your system. It's like writing is like digging for oil. You have to pump out the mud, the yuck, the dinosaur yeah. bones, the water, and then you get to the good stuff. The more you write, Whatever it is that you're writing, do it. Because what you want to get down to is your authentic voice. <coughs> writing is nothing more than talking on the page in your own natural voice. When you hang out with the writers a lot, you learn that they write the way they talk and talk the way they write. There's this notion that somehow writing should sound literary or sound a certain way. No, writing is your natural voice. Mm-hmm. What you have to sell, all of you have to sell, each of you stands on a piece of turf, piece of ground that no one else stands on. No one else has your background, your experience, your knowledge, your information. What, what's your name? Mike. What, what's your last name? Oh, Duffy. Duffy? Duffy. D-U-F-F-Y. Duffy? It's Irish. Yeah. Oh, no, no one's perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there, is, there is no one on the planet who can write a Mike Duffy or <laughs> Duffy script as well as Mike Duffy can write it because no one else has that lens in the middle of your head that was formed by your experiences. If a diamond has value because there are a few of them, how much more rare and valuable is your particular perspective? 
When you hire a writer, you're hiring them for their point of view. You're hiring them for how they see the world and how that story will come through that filter as a result. Mm -hmm. You can give 10 writers the same basic idea, mm -hmm. you'll get 10 very different stories. So whatever you can do to, to just write your brains out nonstop, to get out of your own way and become transparent, which only can happen by every day writing, 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 writing. I, I started writing nonstop when I was 17 years old. I've never stopped every day. And in my, the first three or four years, my stuff sucked. It wasn't the smell, it was the burning of the eyes. It was that bad, you know. And eventually, I wrote out the crap and got to the good stuff. I'm still writing out some crap in my system. There's still some left over there. I'm, to this day, I'm still working on it. But the more you can get those words out of your system and learn to just be transparent and just, here's what it is. Not to belabor your question, which is very simple, but I'm going all over the map. <clears throat> Imagine for a second you're, you're in a dance hall, and there's a guy over here at one end who's just come out of the Arthur Murray Dance School, and he's doing a fine job, but you can hear him in his head going, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. He's trying to dance. Mm -hmm. And over here is Fred Astaire. He's just dancing. There's trying to dance, and there's dancing. There's trying to write, and there's writing. Effortless, joyful, fun. That's where you have to get. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jared, and uh, uh, yeah, all I'm all I'm doing filmmaking. I, I, I like to write a lot, and uh, I like to write for science fiction, fantasy as well. And um, so. Um, Speaking of a little uh, transparency, and uh, no writer is the same kind of uh, on the subject of that. Um, I was wondering. Uh, I know you, uh, you guys, you got a lot of criticisms in uh, in in the past throughout throughout um, with uh, with audio scripts. Uh, how do you know which ones are the best ones to, that are helpful for the story, and which ones to like are, are don't that are not are like down, downright not make no sense. You mean reviews? Yeah, no, 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 like no. Uh, feedback, like... Notes. Notes. <clears throat> you have to be honest. You have to step outside your own ego and say, does the note make sense? If it does, do it. There's nothing wrong with doing it. You, you, you get the bask in the reflected glow of the smartness of that note. If the note is wrong because your heart says it is wrong, because your logic says it is wrong, you don't do it. And you tell them that. Or you lie. <laughs> I used to do this. Here's how, not, I wouldn't say not bright, but um, less in tune sometimes the executives are at studios. Where an example would be, someone says to you, okay, in your script, we have them coming in the door. I think they should come in the window because that's more dramatic. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. Fine. <laughs> You wait six weeks, turn in the script, and you tell them, you know that note you had where instead of having them come in the window, you have to come in the door? You were absolutely right with that. <laughs> it works every time. <laughs> they just want to be heard. They just want to earn their right. salary, you know? Right. And, and <laughs> lying is a completely moral point of view when you're working with some of these guys. Um, but other times, if, if, if you disagree with it, and your heart says, this is wrong, you, you have to fight. You have, to, you have to be a pain in the ass. I cultivated that from a very early age to just say no if I thought it was wrong. But just just be honest with yourself. Okay. You know what I heard um, one, the, one I was nowhere near there. woman director say? We gave her a note, <laughs> a writer, and she said, instead of saying this is a really stupid note, she said, can you tell me what really bothers you in yeah. this scene? The so maybe I can get edited a different way. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that was very smart. Yeah, oftentimes it's getting more to the spirit of the note than the heart than the actual letter of the yes. note. Something in you is bothering, and this is bothering you. You're saying cut this sequence, but are you actually saying that the sequence was too long? Because if that's actually the concern, mm -hmm. I can take out this part over here, which is not essential, as opposed to the point you want to take out, which is the whole right. core of the scene. Right. Yeah. Hello, my name is Brandon Williams, and obviously you wrote Thor, so I, I was just wondering, 
what attracts you to writing all those Marvel character? What what attracts you to that? Well, again, as I mentioned, I, I'm I grew up a fan of the stuff, and I want to kind of give back to a certain extent. Uh, also, a chance to to remold those characters in in new ways. Having grown up on Superman, for instance, I had the opportunity to reinvent the character for DC Comics. He said, we want you to reinvent Superman for the 21st century by doing his original graphic novels, um, which um, became New York Times bestseller list hardcover books. Um, and so having grown up on that character to then form him after me was kind of fun. You know? So it's, for me, it's just giving back. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Why is it there only guys lined up in there? What the hell is wrong with you people? Get up there. Hi, my name is Max. Um, I'd like to say Babylon 5 is my all-time favorite television show, so thank, thank you. you for that. Um, I'd like, I also think you write incredible characters, so I was wondering if you could talk about um, how you go about developing characters, maybe where some of their inspira your inspirations for them come from, and maybe give an example of how this inspiration became a character. Not so much inspiration to become a character as doing the piece work on them. Um, who are they? Where do they come from? What do they want? How far would they go to get it? How far will someone go to stop them? You answer those five questions and you have your, both your character and your story. Every so often you kind of have to look at the people you know if there's a trait there that you can borrow or steal from someone and never tell them about it, of course, because they'll <laughs> sue your ass. Uh, <clears throat> but it, writing is about asking the next logical question. The character comes from uh, the inner city. Has he bought into that or does he want out? If he's bought into it, how is he manifesting that? Is he going into crime? Is he going into uh, other unsavory venues? If he wants out, is he applying for jobs? Does he want to be a cop? What is he? And each question leads to each other question. You tree it out like a logic tree. And at the end of that tree rests your character. Um, there, there, there are no easy solutions to that. It's not, there are no secret handshakes. It's just a matter of just doing this gut work and then making your characters all different from one another by again finding those logical questions to their logical ends. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Howdy. Um, my question is more towards uh, how your experiences on actors interpreting your work. Um, so... When actors try to interpret people from everyday life, they can observe a police officer or they can observe a fireman. But when they're talking about um, science fiction characters and mythical characters, have you heard of the best ways they've used to kind of idealize how that person would be and create the character from an actor's point of view? Again, I think you stay with the basic elements of the human heart. Uh, in Thor, when I sat down with Kevin Feige and those guys start working out what the story was going to be, I said, the core of this, going back to what Jim Cameron said about relationships, is the father-son dynamic. With Thor and his dad, as you said earlier, I believe trying to, you know, the, the, the son trying to make things good with the father, then the jealous son who felt he never got his due. Once you have that dynamic worked out, the fact that they're gods in a foreign place, that dynamic is relatable. Then you can add on to it the Rainbow Bridge and, and the munchkins and um, what else you want to add. Isn't but, it all biblical, though? Didn't hmm? it happen in, in the Bible? Abraham and, and the two sons? To a degree. Um, the, the Norse had a somewhat different take on it. Um, but certainly, and I, I actually, I've read the Bible cover to cover twice. And I think it's, it's a decent book. Um, it, it really needed some good rewriting and a good editor, <laughs> but you can't expect God to be everything. Oh, there's great um, sexy stuff there. Oh, yes. I was a kid, yeah. Um, the hell was I? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it doesn't matter how far flung they are, ancient civilizations or aliens. If you want your audience to actually relate to them, go small, go human. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of Babylon 5 and you know it's a big honor for me to be in here. And I want to ask you for you as a writer, what is more interesting to create 
the big universe like in Babylon 5 or working with like iconic characters like Thor or uh, Superman so what 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 is what is more interesting and the second question is uh, is it possible to see anything else in Babylon 5 universe in the future what do you think is it- um second question first possible we'll get we'll see about what happens on the road with that mm-hmm. so the first question <clears throat> The difference in creating your own characters or working for like in-house established like Thor or Superman or whoever else is that when you're writing your own characters, you can go as far as you want to go. You can make them terrible people. You can have terrible things happen to them. I, I did Spider-Man for seven years. And during that time, you know that you can go from here to there, but you really can't go much further because you will you know, break the equipment. And, and they hand you this character as a trust. We think you're going to serve the character well. Don't hurt it. Yeah. You know? So you really do have, I wouldn't say mittens on, but certainly the, the fingerless gloves, you know, there's partial mittens. <laughs> um, and you also realize that you have much larger responsibility with that character um, because they're, they're a known icon. So, for instance, I was writing Spider-Man when 9-11 hit. And Marvel called me up and said, we need to respond to this. And... Peter Parker is the obvious choice because he lives there. He's a New Yorker. That's how we identify him. We need you to write an issue that somehow addresses 9-11. Like, swell. Yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> for days, I kept trying. And I called him and said, I-, I know the words are in the dictionary somewhere. But what order to put them in and which ones to use is eluding me. So I'll give it one more day and think about it some more. We were shooting Jeremiah um, TV series for Showtime in Vancouver, and I was in the producer's trailer on, on location, and I had this notepad in front of me, and I wrote down, there are no words. And another sentence unfurled itself to me. And in 45 minutes, this prose poem meditation, in a song I've never written in before, emerged that I can't really even take credit for. And I sent it off exactly as written to Marvel. And Axel Alonso, was the editor at Marvel, you know, closed his door and read it and was in tears um, for the right reasons for a change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and when that book came out, the New York Times covered it and firemen shared it to fire stations. It was used in schools as a teaching device about 9-11. And... I got letters from guys who were there and firemen who were there who said, what your book captured was the emotion of that moment. He said, people understand that what we needed the most as we were working in the ruins was shoes because the heat from below was so strong that our, our souls kept melting. Uh-huh. I thought, what a metaphor that is. You know? uh-huh. And when you have a character like Spider, you can address those kinds of important things because he is an icon, whereas your individual characters that are not going to be as well known probably can't do that thank you thank you hi uh my name's john um hi. huge fan of earth one superman um it's been one of my greatest inspirations to start reading comics uh especially with the new 52 that started over mm-hmm. um i was wondering that um how how was your approach towards earth one superman um i found that it was very well written uh everything that you know superman as this you know kryptonian this all-powerful god he everything that was written about it um you know in his daily from day to day life uh i just wanted to know how you went about that it seemed like it was from personal experience you know for yeah, it, it books. comes from a number of different things, but probably the, the seminal image that guided me, that book, the first one in particular, was on the New York Times bestsellers for like half a year. Again, this happened while I was still working up in Vancouver on Jeremiah. And every Wednesday I would go down and get my comics fix downtown. Everybody been to Vancouver? Anybody know Vancouver at all? <clears throat> There's a street called uh, Granville, which is where... Folks of your tribe, you know, guys and gals in their 20s, tend to congregate, you know, and younger, 
you know, 15, 18. It's, it's that age from 15 to 20. You know. And you see them sitting on the curbs, you know, panhandling, asking for money, hanging out, you know, drinking. Uh, my favorite guy there had this sign that he held in front of him said, you know, need money for weed. I thought that was really honest of him. You know? <laughs> and when I went to get my comic books, what I discovered was every once in a while, one of those guys would come into the comic book store and walk down the row of garishly colored books, his eyes hungry for something he could relate to. And he got to the end, and you see light in his eyes go out. And he would go to leave. And sometimes I would follow him out and say, what happened just now? What's going on? And he said, there's nothing there that is like the world I live in. You know? And when time came to do Superman, I thought, let me create a character for that tribe who don't know where they fit in, don't know where they're going. Clark Kent, early 20s, fresh out of college, coming to Metropolis, what does he want to do with his life? I'm not sure he wants to be Superman. He said he could do anything he wanted to do and be profoundly successful at it. But he has to figure that process out. And I thought, let's focus on that. And that became a large part of it. Um, I have introduced a character in the second volume who is his next-door neighbor who works as an escort. And people were at first, you know, horrified by the fact that Superman, that Clark Kent was friends with a hooker. And he wasn't trying to get her out of life. He knew she wanted to get out. That wasn't an issue. The question is, do I respect you for who you are while you're trying to do this? You know? And they became really good friends. And there were a lot of folks who were up in arms about that. But in the third book, we make that work pretty well. So I tried to look at this from a different point of view and, and addressing the concerns of economics, of direction, of, of sexuality, things that you can just not hit too hard because you're so ready for a certain audience, but enough to make it a fresher approach to the character. But it all started with the image of this guy in a hoodie, which was the Superman, the first issue, first book, had wearing the hoodie, which also freaked everybody out. Walking into that store and not saying something he could relate to and feeling what that need was. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, my name is Justin, and I'm a filmmaker, and I, I really want to make a movie that has a really unique or a deep storyline, but, but obviously it, that's not easy. So I was wondering if there's any, what are some of your methods that you use when you need to like think of stories or ideas? Refine that question a bit for me, because you said you want to do deep stories. I'm not sure what you mean by that, and specifically what like you mean by Like a different it. story, like not like a cliche. <laughs> um, I have no answer. The anything, the most fun you can have is taking a cliche subject matter and turning it on its head, um, and looking at things in a different way. And going back again to the next logical question. Here's an example. When I was working on Twilight Zone, I wrote a script called Dream Me Alive about a guy in a retirement home who is sharing dreams with this woman who is catatonic in the next room. And she's asking him for help in, the, in these dreams, and there's something behind the door trying to get through. And there's a and he has to save her from what's behind the door, and it's a monstrous thing, and he saves her. So I was married at the time, and I gave this to my wife at the time to read, and she read it, and they said, well, it's nice. It's nice. You know? <laughs> That's like the last thing you want to hear as a writer, it's freaking nice. You know? And she said, well, it's kind of predictable. It's, a, it's the cliche. It's the monster behind the door, and he saves her from it. And said, but it's nice. It, 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 it's fine. It's good. <laughs> so I thought about it some more, and my approach is always take what is cliche and turn it upside down. So I thought, what if we turn upside down what's behind the door? It's not something trying to get in, it's something she's keeping from getting out. And what if it's the memory of her dead husband, the loss of which put her into this condition in the first place, and she can't let go of him. And what he has to do is knock that door down and let that memory out so they can have a final moment together where she gets to say to him, I, I, I never had a chance to say goodbye to you. He says, you know, you are my dearest love. 
and goodbye. And I want you to live, live for me, and live for the kids. Yeah. And, he, and, he ha- and she has that moment of goodbye. And then when that's gone, she can actually wake up out of the catatonic state. You take the cliche and you turn it upside down. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, sir. How Good evening. You? I'm Tarun Chandra. As a writer, your thoughts will have no boundaries at all. Are there times when you don't get answers for your questions from anywhere at all? If yes, then how do you deal with it? Heroin. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, can, you can always get some kind of an answer. It may not be the answer you're looking for, but you get some kind of an answer. It, it's When I can't find the answer to the question that I need, I know it's either because I'm not being honest with myself character isn't being honest with himself or I haven't thought it through sufficiently and I have to get out of my own way and oddly enough what I found is the the best way of doing that is and this is going to sound nuts but I know a lot of folks do the same thing and it it works more than it doesn't work at night before you go to sleep just start thinking about that problem and then say okay I'm going to turn off my brain now and whatever parts of my brain are still working during the night figure this crap out you know and in the morning you'll open up the box and Half the time, there's the answer. You know? yeah. And uh, I think if I had one of those today, um, I got a script from uh, Imagine Entertainment that Ron wants to direct, on how wants to direct. And th- they said to me, do you want to rewrite this? And well, what would you do? And I read the script, and my first thought was an exorcism. I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to do with this. And last night, knowing the call was today, I said to the gremlins, just, you figure it out. I got no idea. You figure it out. And this morning I woke up, looked in the box, and sure enough, there was an answer. So I got the phone. We love that. That's great. No one's thought of that yet. Yeah. So be open to experimentation. Be open to your own subconscious. Be open to who you are. Sometimes if you're not being honest enough with your own emotions, that answer won't come. The best way you can be as a writer is completely transparent and open to outside influences. Um, there was a poet who mentioned that so then she'd be out in her garden working, and she could feel a poem coming toward her. And her job was to get back to the house fast and get to a pen, because if she'd get there in time, the poem would go past her and find someone else to write. <laughs> yeah. And for the answers to your questions, for the writing process, for the elegance to come, you become transparent, let the writing come through you, and get out of your own way. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi. Um, so being a huge comic book nerd and fan myself. Um, Not a as... huge comic book nerd. You're an average sized comic book nerd. <laughs> right, I'll take it. I'll accept that. Um, I'm a huge comic book nerd. I will accept that too. That's true. Um, no, I was just wondering. I know you touched up on this a bit before with someone that asked a question before me, but I feel like there must be a lot of confines with writing a character in a story that already exists, especially because I feel like you have an existing fan base of people who are like expecting, and you know, you have to kind of respect that it already exists. Are there um, certain pros and cons you could talk about in writing a story that's, you know, centering on stuff that's already there? Um, yeah, it, it's the, the working on things that have already been established. The fun is trying to find what hasn't been done. Um, in working on Superman, that character's been around for over 50 years. You know? And <coughs> how can you find a new story? How can you make something different? And yet not, as you said, annoy the audience. And one of my earlier attempts on this uh, Superman Grounded did annoy some fans. I had him walking across the US, and he flies, and I thought they couldn't buy into it. But what it, the point that I was trying to get to with that story was bringing him down to a human level to deal with human issues in ways that he really hasn't since he was first created. When the first Superman was first born uh, in 1939, I believe it was, um, he dealt with people who were being extorted, with um, <clears throat> petty criminals, with people's lives. And be, the stories became bigger and bigger as he became more powerful. I wanted to bring him back down again to a much more human level. And <clears throat> one of the ways I wanted to do this, which actually worked out really, really well, there's a scene where there's a jumper. Uh, uh, on a skyscraper who's going to jump off and they tell him to go up there and grab her and bring her down. And he goes up and talks to her and, and says, you know, you want me to bring you down? So I'll come down, but I'll just come back up tomorrow. I, mm-hmm. you know, 
And he says, then I'll, I'll sit with you for a while. And he hovers there all day into the night until she's ready to start talking. And talking about why she's upset, why she's angry. And, you know, her, her way she agrees to talk to him is if, if you promise me you won't catch me if I step off the edge, I'll, I'll talk to you. And he makes that promise. And I have him talk about suicide. I've had a number of friends who have killed themselves. So apparently I'm a carrier, it turns out. Um, and he talks about what drove them to that. And so ultimately what they came down to was that that person hit a point when they realized and truly believed they would never have another happy day. It isn't that you decide to kill yourself one day. It's one day you decide to stop living anymore. It's not worth it anymore. And you stop fighting to live. And if you said, if you really reach that point, if you truly believe you will never have another happy day, sip off the ledge. I won't, I won't catch you. But if it's a chance, even that much of a chance for one happy day in there, come to me. And she does. And that conversation had never happened before. It was always, I'll save her, go up and bring her back down again. <laughs> so it's finding those corners that no one has really gone into before that makes it fun. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Rob, that's it. The Hi, two sir. More, right? uh, I'm from China too, but I don't need you to remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> well, well fine. Then, then, I, then I won't. <laughs> Are you going to hire me for anything? Uh, you, can, you can just call me Aina from China. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can call me Joe uh, Schmo. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, my question is about chi Chinese film. Like, uh, now we have a big uh, film market there, and we did some superhero movie there, but they're not so good. I think we tried to imitate the American movie. But we do have different value. I yeah. agree with you, like as a human, was saying we we want to happiness. But uh, what's your opinion, um, like about value? Do you think we should, like, um, from our culture to try to figure out uh, what's our identify? I mean, what's our hero arc, and to create a new story, or we should just use like Western hero style, then use our cultural elements to create like superhero movies? I'll answer that by way of an anecdote, then I'll come back around to it. <laughs> um, that's, that's what I do, I call freaking anecdotes. Um, <clears throat> as we were doing Sense8, um, which is the part which is set in India, in Mumbai, uh, we spent a lot of time researching the culture and the language and the marital customs, all this stuff. We met with a production coordinator from India who said, we are so happy to have this show shooting here because there are two kinds of movies that we make. Our own ethnic films about us, you know, which are only ever seen by us, and we'll export those kind of DVDs. Mm -hmm. And Western stories set against an Indian backdrop. Not about India, it's a Western story, Indian backdrop. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first story we've seen. It's a Western story that's about us, about our culture, who we are, and how we're all excited to have this here. You cannot transplant the Western mentality to the Chinese marketplace without being culturally and sensitively aware to the differences there. And the, the, the ugly American who walks into a, you know, a restaurant in, in, in France and asks for a hot dog, you know, and they beat the crap out of you with baguettes. Um, <laughs> and China still has to find its voice. And right now, a lot of Chinese cinema is looking well to the past, to the fantasy stuff, to the early years of the empire. And it needs to kind of move that dial forward a bit to do things about the current culture. And, and even in the last hundred years, in ways that haven't been as, as exposed as they have been. And there are ways of, of merging those two to make the movie work both, as the other question became before, internationally and in the US. I'll give you an example. During the early days of World War II, um, China, as I'm sure you know, was heavily beset by the Japanese who sent over fighters to attack. China and the Chinese mainland. And this kept going until the Flying Tigers, the American pilots, came in and set up a wall in the sky. And if you talk to, to the Chinese who were there at the time, they said the Japanese would come to us every day and they would bomb us and bomb us. And then the Flying Tigers came in and they stopped. You could do that story. You know, in fact, a, one of my friends, he's 
just trying to do a story like this. Yeah, we we admire those heroes. So you, you can tell from both sides, you know, and but make it authentic to each culture. That's one example of one that crosses both lines. But I think if you are true to Chinese culture and 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 history and heritage, and tell those stories honestly, then I think that there's any market that you want for it. Um, but it needs to move the dial forward to the contemporary period, not just dealing with the past. Thank you so much. We will find our own voice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm from China. <laughs> so, Did you uh, carpool or something? <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Tina. Um, I have a simple question. Is、um, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a simple guy. Yeah. So as a writer, you're more prefer to do like make something like you want or something that the audience wants to see. Like.、Mm-hmm. I think that. The moment you begin thinking too much about the audience, you're doomed.、Um, it has to be sort of that interests you. It, it, because we all contain within us, as I mentioned before, the same basic elements. We all want happiness, love, you know, better future for our kids. If you write something that's true for you, the odds are it'll be true for everybody else, at some level. The moment you think what you should be writing about, then you, you've lost that, and you, what you what you write will be driven by the market. Driven by outside forces rather than your own heart, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the only thing you have of value to sell is your point of view. The audience changes. You can write to a trend right now, but that trend started four years ago when the development process began. Those films, and you're now four years behind the times. Whereas your your heart will always be on time, because your heart's right into the culture right now.、Um, yeah, never. The worst that'll happen is it won't sell. Write the next one. That's what a writer does. You write it, you put it on the market. It sells or it doesn't sell. You write the next one and the next one and the next one. I know a lot of aspiring writers who work for ten years on a script, and the problem is you only learn the lesson that one script had to teach you. The more you write, the more tools you acquire for your toolbox. We all start in the same place with a pair of rusty pliers and a screwdriver. It's all you got. You can only make so much with that. The more you write, the more scripts you write, the more tools you get for your toolbox. It's like you can make more interesting things with that. But that box only opens up with your own heart. The moment you come up to the outside of it and say, "I think I should be writing about this," because that's what the audience wants, the box won't open. So, write your heart. The audience, if they believe in you, will find you. Sensate is that kind of a show. It's a show driven not by plot. Or by gimmick, a lot of science fiction shows about the gimmick, the gadget, the mission, the team. It's about what William Faulkner called the human heart in conflict with itself. That's it's the only thing that's worth writing about in the long run. Only worth the sweat and the blood and the grief. And we sat there for days asking ourselves the most intimate questions. Lana Wachowski, who worked on this project with me, is transgendered, and one of our characters is transgendered. So we got into some. Into the tall grass, some of our conversations.、And、there were times we said, "Do we really risk going there? Do we want to go that far with this? Because it's really intimate stuff. You, you've seen a bunch of it,、mm-hmm. and it works. And it has galvanized the internet in ways that no other Netflix show has ever done. For those of you who don't know this show, we we, we were logging 200 tweets a minute at one point. People were just like, 'Oh my God, look at the show!'、Um, by staying true to the human heart." If you're going to be a writer, what are you selling? Are you selling your point of view, or are you selling what you think people want? If it's the latter, get the hell out. If it's the former, stay in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are we happy that we get the Joe came today and gave up of his time, drove all the way here to the valley? You live、I'm、in the valley. I'm in the valley. <laughs> <laughs> and and I Ubered. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no fool. <laughs> anyway, I think it was like way and beyond more informative and、uh, more entertaining than we actually expected well, and hoped. Well, given me, yeah. <laughs> and we thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I mean. 
Absolutely. We have been in it for years and years and years, and there's always so much to learn. And we learned a lot tonight, and it was fun what we learned, right? Yeah.